Hello, and welcome to Eastern Roman History. In 1204, the Fourth Crusade sacked Constantinople, and, for 57 years, the Eastern Roman Empire was extinguished, when finally, in 1261, it was revived under the leadership of Michael VIII Palaiologos, Emperor of Nicaea. The sack of Constantinople in 1204 was a shocking event, brought about by one of the most colossal cock-ups in European history, the Fourth Crusade. There are a number of fallacies that have cropped up over the years in an attempt to explain, or at least place blame, for this unmitigated disaster. A prominent one I often hear is that it was a conspiracy of the Crusaders and Venetians and that the Crusade was always intended to destroy the Byzantine Empire. This is nonsense, and is not supported by the evidence. Geoffrey de Valhardewin, Chapter 2, Page 32 We have come to you on behalf of the great barons of France, who have taken the cross to avenge the outrage suffered by our Lord, and, if God so wills, to recapture Jerusalem. This shows that right at the very inception of the Crusade, its target was the Holy Land and the Kingdom of Jerusalem and not the Byzantine Empire. Had Alexios IV not enlisted the aid of the Fourth Crusade to retake his throne, then the Crusade would have almost certainly continued on to Egypt. In fact, the Crusaders were on their way to Egypt when Alexios Angelos approached them as they resupplied in Corfu. Michael Langold says of the Fourth Crusade, Michael Langold, The Byzantine Empire, 1025 to 1204, page 293, the diversion of the Fourth Crusade can hardly be called a conspiracy. If there was a conspiracy, it was probably hatched in Constantinople. It seems unlikely that Alexios's escape at a time when it must have been known in Constantinople that over the next year a new crusade would be assembling can have been a complete coincidence. But there was no certainty that Alexios would be able to win the support of the crusade. That he did can only be ascribed to chance. His offer to pay the crusaders 200,000 marks seemed like a godsend at a time of financial embarrassment, and his willingness to assent to the Union of Churches, and to provide military assistance to the Holy Land, provided some moral justification for accepting his proposals. The Venetians, who had the biggest stake in the Crusade, saw an opportunity of, re of recouping their position in Constantinople at the expense of their rivals, the Pisans and the Genoese. They were well informed about the conditions at Constantinople and would have reckoned on considerable opposition to the regime of Alexios Angelos. A less talked about subject, and one of great importance, is the fragmentation of the empire in the years after the death of Manuel Comnenus, and until 1204 with the fall of the capital. The Fourth Crusade was very much like a wrecking ball, smashing the rotten supporting beam of a crumbling wall, which, though it might have taken many years to fall, and perhaps even been repaired, was, at that moment, in the grips of decline. If one looks at this map of the Partitio Romane, the spotted area on the map shows what the Crusaders did not lay claim to when they apportioned out the Empire of the Romans to each other. This partition was most likely based on imperial tax documents that no longer survive, that the Crusaders recovered in Constantinople, and also what the Venetians could tell them. As one can see, parts of the empire are not mentioned in the partition, and since this partition was made in 1204, after the fall of the capital, it is likely that these areas had seceded from the authority of Constantinople before the Crusaders captured it. These areas included Eastern Macedonia, Western Thrace, and much of the Balkan hinterlands, Central Euboea, Boeotia, the northeastern Peloponnese around Corinth, the area around Sardis, roughly corresponding to the old Phrixicion theme, Crete, Rhodes, Cyprus, 
the Asiatic coast of the Sea of Marmara, stretching from Abydos to Nicaea, as well as the area corresponding to the themes of Seleucia and Kibereos, stretching from Lycia to Seleucia. So how did this come about? First, let us look at this map of the empire in 1180. It is in control of the Balkans and much of the coasts of Anatolia. Upon the death of Manuel I Comnenus, during the reign of Alexios II, Bela III of Hungary took back Dalmatia, Bosnia and Sirmium in the Western Balkans. The Prince of Serbia, Stephen, renounced his tributary status under the Byzantines. In Asia Minor, Kilij Aslan II took Cortium, Sozopolis, and everything up to Atalia, cutting the south of Anatolia off from the north. King Rubin III of Little Armenia conquered Cilicia and, in Paphlagonia, Andronicus Comnenus rebelled against the regency of Alexius II. All of this occurred from 1180 to 1181 after the death of Manuel. In 1182, John Vatatzes rebelled in Philadelphia against Alexios the Proto-Sebastos, who was regent for Alexios II. In 1183, Bela III took Serdica and the Morava Valley. In that same year, Andronicus had been crowned co-emperor with Alexios and the Latin population of Constantinople was massacred. Meanwhile, Theodore Cantacuzanos and Isaac Angelos rebelled in Nicaea. In 1184, with Alexios II now dead, Andronicus crushed the Hungarian army and drove them back to Belgrade, as well as brutally suppressing the revolt of Cantacuzanos and Angelos in Nicaea. In 1185, Isaac Comnenus proclaimed himself Emperor of Cyprus and effectively made it independent of Constantinople. That same year, the Normans invaded Greece, much like how they did in 1081, but this time they managed to sack Thessalonica. During this invasion, Andronicus was overthrown by Isaac Angelos and was horrifically lynched by the Constantinopolitan mob. In 1186, Isaac II made peace with Hungary with a marriage alliance and defeated the Norman invasion. Isaac sent a fleet to regain Cyprus from Isaac Comnenus. The Norman admiral Margaritus captured the Roman ships and Isaac Comnenus took the army of the expedition prisoner. Margaritus then went on to capture several Ionian and Aegean islands. Most damningly, there was a Vlach and Bulgarian rebellion in Bulgaria, which, with Cuman help, succeeded in establishing the Second Bulgarian Empire. In 1188, Fyodor Mangarfus rebelled in the old Phryxikion theme and took control of it, with Philadelphia as its capital. When the crusade of Frederick Barbarossa passed through, Fyodor Mangarfus acted completely independently of the court of Isaac Angelos. Isaac II Angelos managed to fix a border between Roman and Bulgarian domains in the Balkans, and even drove them out of Varna, Anchialus, and Serdica. In the autumn, he drove the Serbs out of the Morava Valley, which they had occupied. In 1191, King Richard the Lionheart of England took control of Cyprus from the tyrant Isaac Comnenus. Philadelphia was retaken from Theodore Mangarfus, who fled to the Seljuk Turks. After this incident, three rebellions occurred one after the other, proclaiming a pseudo-Alexius II as emperor in Anatolia. The sheer number of rebellions in Anatolia seems to have been a symptom of the numerous raids against the frontiers by the Turks. Isaac II was largely focused on the west, especially with the recovery of Bulgaria. Local aristocrats in Pranoia looked to themselves as the answer to their problems. Fyodor Mongarfus is a prime example of this and explains why Anatolia was the centre of the majority of local separatism at this time. Isaac was deposed and blinded by his elder brother Alexios Angelos, now Alexios III. He gave up his brother's ambition of defeating Bulgaria, which proved a major long-term error since Isaac, had he succeeded, may have restored Bulgaria as a Roman province. In 1196, Chrysus the Vlach 
commander of Stromitza, revolted against Alexios. In 1198, Alexios III restored the Roman-Venetian alliance, which had been torn up by Manuel Komnenos in 1171. In 1199, Ivanko, the commander of Philippopolis, and in charge of the main army defending against Bulgaria, rebelled. Alexios assassinated him in 1200, restoring Philippopolis. That same year, John Angelos Ducas rebelled and raided the Meander Valley with the Turks. Theodor Mungarfus retook control of Philadelphia as well. In 1201, Manuel Kamitsis took control of Western Thrace and Eastern Macedonia. Leo Seguros took control of Corinth and Naupulion and began extending his domain into Attica and Boeotia. Leo Camaretos took control of Moria and Laconia. In 1202, Alexios III managed to defeat Manuel Kamitsis and restore Macedonia and Thrace to his control. In 1203, Alexios IV arrived with the Fourth Crusade. Dyrrachion, Corsira, Euboea and Abydos proclaimed their support for the young prince. Once the capital had been besieged by Alexios IV, Alexios III fled to Adrianople. After the first siege of Constantinople, Theodore Lascaris fled Constantinople and established himself in Nicaea. By the end of 1203, Alexios III had authority over Western Thrace. Leo Gabalas probably was de facto ruler of Rhodes by this point. Aldadrandus, an Italian who was raised as a Roman, had control of Italia after 1204. It is possible that with the severance of this province from the rest of the empire in 1180 to 1181, the area was most likely de facto under his control prior to the fall of Constantinople. Alexios Megas Komnenos and David Megas Komnenos, the grandsons of Andronicus I Komnenos, captured Trebizond a few days before the siege and fall of Constantinople to the Fourth Crusade. As one can see, the empire was starting to fall apart, with an increasing number of centrifugal forces working to carve out their own portion of the empire due to the failure of the centre, which, from the records of Michael and Nikitas Konyatis, was spiralling out of control and on the verge of collapse. To explain this fragmentation, I shall finish with an extract from Michael Angold, who says in Michael Angold, The Byzantine Empire, 1025 to 1204, page 277 to 278. Under the Angeloi, the imperial government found it more and more difficult to control local power, whence the increasing lawlessness in many provinces. In the southeastern corner of Asia Minor, an archon of the town of Mylassa simply appropriated an olive plantation which he leased from the monastery of St. Paul on Mount Latros. After his death, his heirs proved no more amenable to demands of the monastery for the return of their property. The monastery had the support of the imperial administration, but this seems to have had no effect. The local Archontes did much as they pleased. In Epirus, a local magnate, backed by an armed retinue, carried off a rich widow and forced her to marry him. He obtained a statement from his fellow Archontes of the town of Colonia in the effect that no force had been used to acquire his wife. The upshot was a vendetta between the magnate and his bride's family. Her brother came and seized him. He then married his sister off to somebody of his own choice. The Angeloi were learning to condone the excesses of local power rather than risk open rebellion. How else were they to ensure the continuing collection of taxes, which was the primary function of the imperial administration? The fatal weakness of provincial administration under the Angeloi was a willingness to connive at local power combined with oppressive and erratic taxation. Judith Heron has shown what sorry consequences this combination had for the Greek lands. The praetor of the theme of Hellas descended upon Athens, 
demanding to be put up with all his train. Tax commissioners wanted payment for the privilege of assessing the taxpayers for taxation. Demands were made for additional taxes. Worst was perhaps ship money. This was raised by three different agencies, the Praetor staff, the Grand Duke's agents, and by Leo Seguras, who was in control of the town of Naupulion. Athens was apparently more vulnerable than its neighbours, Thebes and Europos, which were able to fend off the demands for taxation. In the end, the people who paid were the peasantry, and Michael Cognates, the Archbishop of Athens, ended a petition that he addressed to Alexios III Angelos in 1198 with a plea that the Archontes of Athens should be prevented from acquiring more peasant land. The peasants were in danger of being blown hither and thither like leaves before the wind, as he says. Michael Cognates bewails the failing prosperity of Attica. The main cause was the oppressive fiscal administration. Worse still, for all their demands, the imperial government failed to protect the region from depredations of the pirates who now swarmed through the Aegean. The failure of the imperial government was reflected in the way local men established themselves as independent rulers in the Peloponnese. Such a man was Leo Suguras. He inherited control of the town of Naupulion in the Argolid from his father, and he took advantage of the chaos existing at the end of the century to extend his authority to Argos and Corinth. He almost certainly had local backing. His opponents were bishops such as Michael Cognates, who kept alive traditions of loyalty to the imperial government at Constantinople. The truth was that by 1203, the imperial government had lost effective control over most of the provinces of the empire. It was just one sign of the way the empire was collapsing from within. I have been your host Daniel Maynard. Please do like, subscribe and share this video. And this has been Eastern Roman History.